Burgess is entrepreneur in residence and director of programs at the Choka Center for Principled Entrepreneurship at the Catholic University of Amer America, where he's also an assistant clinical professor of business. Luke is a veteran entrepreneur who has founded multiple companies across the tech, healthcare, and consumer product spaces. He is the author of the best-selling book, Wanting, The Power of Mimetic Desire in Everyday Life, published in 2021, which has now been translated into more than 20 languages and won numerous awards. His essays and other writing have appeared widely in publications ranging from Literary Hub to Wired Magazine to First Things. Luke is the co-founder with Dr. Joshua Miller of the Inscape Center for Personal Vocation in Steubenville, Ohio, and he lives with his family in Washington, DC. Please join me in welcoming Luke Burgess. Thank you, Marlo, and thanks to Johnny and the ISI. When Johnny extended the invitation to me to be here today, uh, which I had the honor to accept, I did my best to dissuade him uh, because I knew I'd be delirious and sleep deprived. Uh, I knew that this would be pushing right up against the birth of my first child. Um, I knew it would be a short time in between. I didn't know quite how short. She was born uh, just a few days ago. So I, uh, I thank you. Um, so I, I wrote my speech today, which I normally don't do, and it's it's a win-win. It's better for you and for me uh, this way. So R Rome Burgess uh, arrived just a few days ago. So Dostoevsky's novella, Notes from the Underground, opens with a line that could be used to describe a first-time sleep-deprived father like me, but really frames everything that I want to talk about today. It begins like this. I'm a sick man. I am a spiteful man. I'm an unattractive man. I believe my liver is diseased. These are the words of the underground man in Dostoevsky. He's just a minor government worker who has retreated from the normal world and lives a relatively, relatively solitary life, or so he thinks. He's resentful, envious, and spiteful, but he believes that he's at least free free from the structures that confine all of the idiots around him. The underground man attempts to challenge the new laissez-faire philosophers of his day, primarily English philosophers, those who claim that people could act on the basis of their own enlightened self-interest, and if they did so, then it would solve all of our problems, economic problems, political problems, relationship problems. The underground man deems this as total nonsense, and he strives to challenge that idea by acting as selfishly as humanly possible. Over the course of the book, his rejection of this enlightened self-interest traps him in the prison of unenlightened self-enslavement. He inflicts the maximum amount of pain both to himself and to everybody around him for the duration of the book. To loosely paraphrase Rene Girard, the modern-day hipsters leave the beaten path only to fall into the same ditch. That's the underground man. So this book is considered by some to be the first existential novel. It deals with the inner psychology of the characters in this classic Dostoevsky way that eventually made him famous as an author. But I think this book is particularly relevant for this gathering because we're limited when we talk about economics without mentioning these deeply human topics like psychology, philosophy, or spirituality. They're all connected. I'm also interested in this underground man because we live in a world that has an above ground and an underground. And the difference between the two is not always clear. There's also an above ground economy and an underground economy. In our daily lives, we engage with this above ground economy when we visit pharmacies, for instance. The underground economy thrives in the shadows on corners all across America. But it would be a mistake to think of the underground as simply illegal or illicit. It's much more than that. The underground also includes the hundreds of DC staffers who were carrying around copies of the Bronze Age mindset in 2019. The dangerous ideas, the resentments, the secret quest for power about which people whisper but never shout. I wonder, what are the forces that are driving this flight to the underground. It seems strange, doesn't it? We live at a time that is ostensibly more transparent than ever. Yet, 
the underground is all around us. We also live, in my opinion, in very apocalyptic times. And by apocalypse, I simply mean everything is being unveiled. There's this great revealing, revelation. It seems like there are no more secrets to me sometimes. Everything is being brought to light between technology, media, the online discourse with a capital D. Nothing is sacred anymore, it seems. The sacred always has this element of hiddenness or concealment about it. Now, everything appears to be above ground, maybe even kind of profane, partly due to the inescapable glare of iPhones and Android phones. The cult of saints has been replaced by the cult of experts. Everyone has gone from being an immunologist to an economist with a specialty in inflation in the course of just three years. It also seems that many people have become experts in social construction. There's always a new system, a new structure, right around the corner that will fix everything. And we're totally flooded with content. The novelist Caro Taro Greenfeld wrote back in 2014, it's never been so easy to pretend to know so much without actually knowing anything at all. We pick topical, relevant bits from Facebook, Twitter, or emailed news alerts, and then we regurgitate them. What we all feel now is the constant pressure to know enough at all times, lest we be revealed as culturally illiterate. We come perilously close to performing a pastiche of knowledgeability that is really a new model of know-nothingness." End quote. We're all flirting with this new world of content while harboring profound feelings of confusion about what's actually really going on. So I would like to reframe things today using this image of the above ground and the underground. And I'd like to do that for two main reasons. First, the moment that we think that everything is above ground, that everything is being revealed, is the very moment that we're most tempted to go into the underground. Our sins, things like lust and pride and envy, love to lie in the dark. They like to stay in the underground. Second, we have to ask honestly, is there an honorable place for the underground? Is there a place for the underground? If the answer is yes, then what kinds of things should we build in the underground? For instance, if you're feeling like you're unfairly targeted, politically, religiously, for whatever reason, do you move your life online to a Discord server or a group text message? Do you take the black pill? Do you opt for the Benedict option? I hope to attempt to answer some of these questions today, just to, just to make a start. I titled this talk, The Architects of Desire, so I'd like to speak a little bit about this architecture of desire in our economy, using what I've just said as a bit of a setup. To that end, please keep this underground man running around in your mind for the next 10 or 15 minutes or so, no matter how unpleasant he might be. I first started thinking about this intersection of uh, architecture and desire when I lived in Vegas back in 2008. As you know, there are lots of architects of desire in Vegas. Uh, casinos, attorneys, the mob, they designed the whole Las Vegas Strip so that people would want to gamble. They are architects of desire. Vegas, from its music to its air conditioning to its extravagant nightclubs, everything is wholly oriented towards risk-taking, making big bets, and doing things that you might not want to do anywhere else. And that's what I mean by architects of desire. These are the kinds of people that are thinking very intentionally about how to direct human wanting to certain ends through intentional design. Shortly after I moved to Vegas in 2007, I became friends with Tony Shea, who at the time was the CEO of a company called Zappos.com. Tony had already sold the company for about $300 million. Uh, he's very wealthy. And now his new company, Zappos, was about to surpass a billion dollars in sales. He was this eccentric uh, caricature of all the great Silicon Valley entrepreneurs, became a very, very close friend of mine. At the time, he was one of the most talked about entrepreneurs in the whole country. Uh, for anybody that wanted good PR, they would visit Vegas and they would take a tour of the Zappos headquarters, which was famed for their amazing company culture. Kanye, Serena Williams, Ivanka Trump, they all went to the Zappos headquarters when they visited Vegas and got their picture taken with Tony. Tony and I had both identified Vegas as the next, 
kind of frontier in the startup world. I take a lot of pride in this because it's back in 2007. Um, I, I was a tax immigrant to Vegas from, from California. And I think that's partly what made Tony and I pretty good friends. My company, FitFuel.com, and his company, Zappos.com, were two of the more well-known e-commerce businesses that were operating out of Vegas at the time. At one point, Tony signaled his uh, intent to buy FitFuel, and we negotiated throughout the year in 2008. Um, that was a very rough year. When we started the negotiations, everything was going very well, and the negotiations started to fall apart about halfway through the year as the real estate market blew up. But I was uneasy and unnerved for a different reason, not just the, the shaky negotiations. And that's what I saw going on underground, in the underground, at Zappos. I saw the underground man all over the place. Now, I only had access to this underground because Tony had invited me into it. To this day, I'm not entirely sure why. Uh, it may be because I like to party a lot in those days. I don't know. But I, I saw the soft, dark underbelly of the whale that was the famous Zappos company culture. And people seemed like they weren't very happy in it. And I wasn't very happy. In fact, I was miserable. The truth is, I was undergoing a uh, very serious spiritual conversion at the time in the midst of these negotiations and uh, my days living in Vegas. I began to see this typical startup culture and the Vegas lifestyle as relatively uh, empty, as leaving me very wanting. The prospect of building another company really fast to create some flash valuation just so that I could exit it or sell it as quickly as possible left me totally underwhelmed. I didn't care. So this plunged me into an existential crisis, of course, because everything that I thought was important, everything around which I'd built my life as an entrepreneur, no longer seemed very important. It's funny, I think these critical moments in life uh, very often are thrown into relief or made clear through juxtapositions. For instance, seeing an act of love in a war zone may be much more meaningful to a person than seeing it in a coffee shop or on the subway. For me, at that time, the juxtaposition was between above ground hierarchy and underground anarchy. Because Tony Shea hated hierarchy. He'd adopted this uh, new management system, some of you may have heard of this fancy term, called holacracy which treated each person as a whole I should say holacracy TM, trademarked. Uh, somebody invented this and has made a lot of money selling this idea. Um, each person is a whole on an autonomous, wholly contained unit moving in and out of smaller teams as they please. Uh, everyone is both equal and totally free. The management structure at Zappos disappeared overnight. They just did away with all of the visible hierarchy. Um, even Tony Shea himself relinquished his title as CEO. Tony became just some guy who was a whole on like everybody else in the company. Uh, employees had to publicly, publicly negotiate their pay each year. Um, and it just evolved into complete chaos, right? This was just supposed to be this utopia, this new management system that was going to change the world. Uh, in Tony's destruction of these above ground structures, uh, I remember G.K. Chesterton's fence, if any of you know this image. Uh, Chesterton used the image of a fence erected across a road to symbolize the institutions or laws that don't immediately make sense to somebody. He wrote that the modern type of reformer goes up to that fence and says, I don't see the use of this, let's clear it away. To which the more intelligent type of reformer will answer, if you don't see the use of it, I certainly won't let you clear it away. Go away and think, and then, when you can come back and tell me that you do see the use of it, then I'll let you destroy it. Tony was certainly the former. The destruction of hierarchy at Zappos led to the ascension of the underground. Interpersonal rivalries started to boil over and a very invisible hierarchy formed that would put Mean Girls to shame. On the surface, Tony's project was still being written about by the New York media machine as this great project that would make everybody happy. He created what in Italian we call a bella figura, 
something that's beautiful on the outside but quite ugly on the inside. He had tried to become an architect of desire. He wanted to set up his company as a kind of happiness machine, but it drove some of them to literal suicide. Even during this moment that Tony had in the spotlight, the real forces that were at work were all in the underground. Within Zappos, Tony was the epicenter of a mimetic cycle. He was the exemplar whose behavior and ambitions were mirrored by all of his followers. Yet, the desires that were cultivated there, that were important there, uh, were not geared towards any kind of higher transcendent aim. They were tethered to the commercial success and kind of utopian work culture. Uh, that Tony deeply, deeply wanted to create. The goal of delivering happiness morphed into a relatively self-referential loop. I like to refer to some desires that humans have as thin desires. These are these mimetically driven and highly fleeting desires. And other desires are thick. These are the things that you can pursue your whole life and the, the well never runs empty. Like a virtue would be an example of a thick desire. And I believe that a great, a really great architect of desire, the kind that we need, builds things that orient people towards these thick desires. In his classic book, Prayer as a Political Problem, a book that I really enjoy, uh, Jean Daniel Liu sort of saw the, the church bell, which at one time used to be the highest point in every city, as symbolic of this uh, orientation towards the thick. At Zappos, it was a bottle of Fernet. Zappos was starved of the nourishment that comes from thick desires, and the snake began to eat its tail. Let me cut to the end of this story. Tony sold Zappos to Jeff Bezos for well over a billion dollars in 2009. I missed out on that. Uh, and then he moved to Park City and tried to create a utopia there instead. Uh, Tony tragically died in a fire in November of 2020. We'd stayed in touch for much of the time in between, except for those last couple of years when he descended uh, into a, a much darker place. Back in 2009, at around this time, I walked away from my company and uh, began to study philosophy and theology, which led me on a serious discernment of the priesthood, but that's a story for another day. But over all those years, the question that I always struggled with was, what would have made Tony Shea happy? What really would have made him happy? My answer to that question was ultimately a theological one. But I couldn't help but see that what had happened in downtown Vegas and what happened at Zappos was really a problem of the underground. And I, I'm talking about the underground because I see this happening in our world today in different ways. And it worries me. I'm not just referring to the attacks on the visible above ground institutions, things like abolish the police where the supposed replacement is not even in the underground. It just doesn't seem to exist at all. But it worries me most of all because of the false belief that we can actually rewrite the rules of desire. So let's turn back to the underground man for a minute. He was someone who thought of himself as free from the, quote, problematic society which he had extricated himself from. He was disgusted with everyone, even with himself. And I, I don't think that anybody has commented more poignantly on the underground man than the French social theorist René Girard. So I'll give you a brief introduction to, to what he thought about the underground and why this is highly relevant to economics and what's going on in our country today. Girard saw that the substrate of the entire economy was human desire. It's the stuff out of which the economy is really made, hidden be beneath the surface. The economy is no more than a system that helps people know and get what they think they want. And think is a key word here. Girard's mimetic theory is premised on the idea that the very nature of human desire is mimetic or imitative. That is, we want things because we see someone else wanting those things first, meaning we take them as a model of our own desire without knowing that we're doing that, and we unconsciously adopt their objects of desire as our own, even while thinking of ourselves as completely independent. In Girard's view, the entire economy is a kind of a medic machine where various desires are modeled and peddled to us by other people without them even realizing that they're doing this. And I think it's a mimetic economy more than it's ever been. 
Paul Mazur, a Lehman Brothers banker in the early 20th century, who was a true architect of desire, saw the shift coming, and he wrote back in the 1920s, we must shift America from a needs-based culture to a desires-based culture. People must be trained to desire, he said. They must be trained to want new things even before the old has been entirely consumed. We must shape a new mentality in America. Man's desires must overshadow his needs. So desires, as opposed to needs, according to Rene Girard, are mimetic in nature. They're contagious. And this means that they're subject to manipulation and a kind of hidden coercion. And there's maybe some connection to Sorab's talk from this morning and his book, right? These kind of hidden soft powers of coercion. We need not force people to do our will through violence anymore. We can simply nudge them through secret mechanisms which are hidden in the underground, hidden beneath their conscious awareness. I believe the most important kind of coercion is not political, but it's this soft hidden power, the hidden actors who exercise this power behind the scenes, more puppeteer than Pinocchio. I think that when we start focusing too much on the obvious external structures and fixes, we miss the roots. An obvious example of this soft, coercive power would have been uh, Eddie Bernays, if you know the story. He's the father of PR. Uh, he was hired by the head of the American tobacco company, George Hill, in 1929 to boost um, the percentage of smokers in the country, because it would be a huge win. It would double his profits, because at the time, women didn't smoke. It was taboo, especially for women to smoke in public. So he hired Bernays, and he orchestrated this stunt to, um, he planted packs of Lucky Strike cigarettes on these women, and as they're walking down the Easter Day Parade in Fifth Avenue, uh, he gave them a cue, they whipped them out at the same time, and started smoking these cigarettes. And Bernays lay waiting on the, the sideline with a headline for all the newspapers across the world, and he said that these women were smoking torches of freedom. He drove the adoption of smoking through rivalry. He positioned smoking as a women's rights issue. Smoking would symbolize equality with men. So he set up this PR campaign as a classic mimetic campaign. He simply needed to provide the right models alongside the right rivals, and he could get people to do anything, even if it was against their self-interest, even if it was detrimental to their health, even if it made them feel real good while they were doing it, and thinking to themselves how powerful they were. Notice that all of this, all of Bernays' campaign happened in the underground. Nobody knew this. It was all orchestrated. It was all a show. It seemed spontaneous, but it was orchestrated behind the scenes. They were coerced into smoking without even knowing it. Gerard wrote, and I quote, one goes underground as a result of frustrated mimetic desire. All underground people carefully hide their imitation even from themselves, so as not to give their models the psychic reward of seeing themselves imitated, and not to humiliate themselves by being revealed as imitators. Nobody who started smoking thought of themselves as an imitator, but rather powerful, independent people. So Girard believed that this principle of rivalry was a key part of human society, and in fact, one of the principles at the heart of human relationships. Mimetic desire naturally leads to rivalry because the very nature of mimesis leads people to want the same things. They're taking people as models of desire. And then to see those people as obstacles in their path. This touches on the immigration debate, in my opinion. The underground man is an obstacle addict, in fact. He can't help but become obsessed with everybody that he thinks slighted him, whose social status he secretly desires, and it ends up consuming him. And his story is a cautionary tale for all of us. When people retreat into the underground, they begin to perceive the entire world differently. Gerard wrote the following words in the early 1960s, and I think they're the most relevant words um, that I've read in a long time describing the world today. He wrote, if we project our own mimetic tangles upon society as a whole, then the more entangled we are, 
the more rigid and tyrannical the social order will appear to us, even if, in reality, it is collapsing. To revolutionists of the Dostoevsky type, the more feeble society becomes, the more oppressive and repressive it seems. It seems. Think about that. The more feeble society becomes, the more oppressive and repressive it seems to those who are most mimetically entangled. And think about this next time you're scrolling Twitter. We begin to see demons everywhere, even where none actually exist. Now, it's true that the injustices of our world are more apparent than ever. Almost every news story is framed in terms of victimhood. Cultural debates are always about who's the bigger victim. And that's another key insight of Girard. Christianity, in Girard's view, unmasked the truth of the innocent victim. Not Steven Pinker, not the Enlightenment, but biblical revelation. And now it's the defense of victims that is most widespread worldwide, the greatest absolute value, the one that everybody can agree on throughout the world. That's why positioning oneself as a victim is one of the most powerful ways, powerful tactics that a person can use to get what they want. The truth about injustice, the truth about victims, has moved from the underground to the above ground. Victimhood status is now in the above ground. We all see it. It's in the light. It's out there in the open, and the rivalries are clearer than ever. But this victimhood game is always going to be a zero-sum game, isn't it? Focusing on the rivalries, on the scapegoats, on petty political action, especially in a world where political action is fairly impotent, it seems to me. This all takes our focus off of the real opportunities in front of us. We can reshape this economy with new models of desire. We can model the kinds of desires that the people who built the great cathedrals of Europe had in mind. They built structures which, rather than direct attention to the structures themselves or to themselves, pointed people to something that transcended them. And it's up to us to build those things. I, I'm not an academic, I'm an entrepreneur. And I think about, you know, it's, it's my job, and it's the job really of all of us to pursue objects that transcend the zeitgeist. We have to invest in building institutions that will move, um, that will move the world and not move with the world. There's a big difference. We can build things that fire the human spirit. Now, let me be clear. I think we have many architects of desire in our economy already that are very powerful, for better or worse. Some of these people run companies that build things that direct desires specifically towards increasing rivalry because that increases their profits. If we're arguing about how much we hate Twitter while we're on Twitter, well, that's fine with Elon Musk because he obviously profits from that. Now, the danger of building in the underground is that the spirit of the underground takes over. It's dark, damp, dirty sewage sweeps into our souls. It's too late to go back to the catacombs at this point. We've got to build in the streets and in the light and not in the sewers. We have to roll up our sleeves and engage with the messy world out there and not retreat to building ideological ghettos. And beware of falsely solving problems in the above ground by pushing them underground where the complexity of human desire begins to take control and self-conceit dominates. Personally, I believe that any efforts to build parallel economies, monolithic universities, are ultimately going to fail. The idea of building liberal companies and conservative companies is small spirit and sometimes just plain pathetic. I think we're better than that and that we should be building in the above ground. Things that are visible, which allow the human spirit to be unleashed, things that edify. We have to roll up our sleeves and actually grapple with the messiness of the world out there. In Augustine's words, um, every human person has a capex day, a capacity for God, and we can build things that honor that capacity or not. If we do, we have the possibility of transcending the petty rivalries that we see in which we may even get enmeshed in. I don't think this approach has been tried and found wanting. 
Rather, it's been found difficult and hardly ever tried. We all have a temptation to build in the underground. That is my temptation too because of how easy it is to build in the underground. It's easy. It's easier than building above ground. For instance, especially for those of us like me that spend way too much time online. That allows other people to architect our desires for us, specifically by showing us what we hate. Anger, irritation, depression, all of these things that we feel at what we see, these are not purely emotions or feelings. There's always a frustrated desire there underneath the surface, lurking somewhere underneath a deviated desire in the underground. Few people follow that desire to the end or even find out what it's telling them about themselves or about the world. So we have a role to play in generating and shaping the objects of desire that will make for a more humane economy in America, which is what this forum is all about. And we do that by modeling what it means to be fully human. This allows a new American economy to take shape and grow by attraction and not by detraction, not by anger and the creation of scapegoats that we can hardly keep up with. As architects of desire, we have to build on a foundation uh, on a, of a real anthropology and one that recognizes the deepest desires of the heart. I don't just mean companies. I mean families, communities, friendships, the things that are most accessible to us today, things that we can start building as soon as we get home or right here. So maybe we can start by asking the basic question, what do we want people to want? What do we want to want? If we can't answer that question, then it will surely be answered by our rivals or by our enemies. I'll conclude with this. My dad has Alzheimer's disease. And after my mom passed away in uh, 2021, I took over his care. Uh, I'm an only child, so it's been a hard road. It, it, all, it all falls on me. And I spend a great deal of my time and effort ensuring that he lives in a dignified way. For instance, by not allowing uh, the hospitals to keep him in uh, the hospital gowns that don't cover his whole body. Um, I've taken it upon myself to, to find ones that uh, seem more dignified. Um, or smuggling a beer into the nursing home to drink with him from time to time. Or, or watching game one of the 1984 World Series um, every day and acting just as excited as he is when Kirk Gibson hits that home run. Um, we've been watching it for two years now, almost every day. And I'm lucky that my dad trusts me completely. And oftentimes when I ask him simple questions like what he wants, like what he wants for lunch, he'll answer, Luke, I want whatever you want. Because he knows that I love him. He knows that my desires are totally tied in with his well-being. I don't think about what I want. My desires are completely bound up with what's best for him. And isn't that the way that it's supposed to be? Based on what I want, I'm shaping the desires and the health and the well-being of my dad and of my newborn daughter, maybe even some of the people that read my work, because we're all bound together and I have a duty to my neighbor. I believe that we have to live as if we have a responsibility for what other people want. Like it or not, we do. So the question I'll leave you with is the same question that I ask myself almost every day these days. As an architect of desire, what structures can I build in my family, in this university that I'm part of, in my community, or in my nation, that brings what is hidden in the underground to light? What can I build above ground that helps orient my desires and those of the people around me towards a clear destination? towards what is true, good, and beautiful. The former president of Notre Dame, Theodore Hesburgh, once wrote that the very essence of leadership is that you have to have vision. You cannot blow an uncertain trumpet, he wrote. He was, to borrow a, a phrase from Peter Thiel, a definite optimist. So, when it comes to this economy of desire, we can't build without a, a blueprint. We can't follow uncertain desires. We can't be agnostic about certain technologies. We can't be wavering on key moral questions and nihilistic 
when it comes, or relativistic, when it comes to the primacy and importance of some desires as opposed to others. So I do think it's possible to start with this question, what do we want to want? And then create things that move us in that direction rather than developing new technologies, closing our eyes and hoping for the best in the name of innovation. I think everyone in this room would at least agree on this point. What we want to want, what I think everybody in this room wants is a more humane economy. If you're here, you probably already realize that you want that. But many others don't seem to have discovered that desire and it's truly up to us to give it to them. So don't give up that fight and don't give up on living above ground. Thank you. Thanks so much, Luke. We have time for a couple of questions. And like I said earlier, if you're a student, you get first dibs. So who has questions? I'm not a student, but Luke, uh, this, was, this was just such a timely talk. And um, what, what would you say to a young man who is finding a sense of fulfillment in this underground world that you're talking about, the one where it's, it's online, it's retreating to the group chats, it's, 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 it's withdrawing himself from this ab above ground world that he should be building in, but that he's found the solidarity that he has lacked in that above ground world. I mean, w w just on like that person to person basis, what would you say to someone like that to kind of um, make them come back above ground? Yeah. The first thing that I would say, and I, I have many um, students at this university, I, I feel very blessed to be here at this university because the first thing that I would say is that there is such a thing as, a, as an underground place um, that can be good. Uh, and the negative or toxic underground that I was describing today, I think is a substitute for something else. So perhaps for me, uh, the, the nourishing underground is you know, my spiritual life, right? Those, those places where I go to, to get filled up, right? The underground, um, as opposed to, you know, I don't know, some DM thread that I'm part of, right? We just talk about everything that we think is wrong with the world. Um, you know, which can eat away at me. So I think there's a healthy underground is what I would say. And you've got to find out what that healthy underground is for you. Because um, oftentimes that's where you, you gain the strength to go above ground and actually join the, the battle. But I do think that that's where the most important institutions and, and work uh, is going to take place. I think it's going to have to be ab above ground. And I think this, the siloing that we're seeing, um, there may be a place for it in some cases. But Overall, I don't think it's going to get us to where we need to go. Sorry, was that too dark of a talk for everybody? <laughs> yep. Uh, would manipulating desire be related to advertising? The question was, wouldn't desire be related to well, advertising? The idea that desire is mimetic, seeing other people want things, isn't that what, what the method of adver advertising, all these ads we see everywhere, on the net, on TV? I mean, advertising, that's what got people to smoke. You said, you know, it can get people to buy electric cars or whatever. Yeah, advertising is, a, is a, the most classic example of, you know, mimetic desire. Advertisers might not use those words, but they've been doing it for a very, very long time. They never show you the, you know, try to sell you on the thing that they want you to buy. They show you somebody else who wants that thing, and they try to sell you on that person and, and, and imitating that person's desire for that thing. Um, there was a shift in 1986 when it came to mimetic desire in advertising in a very specific Pepsi commercial, I believe it's 1986, where um, all of a sudden the advertising became ironic for the first time. And if uh, those of you who are as old as I am might remember the commercial where everybody's on the beach on a hot, sunny day, and this van pulls up, and somebody 
you know, cracks open uh, a can of Pepsi and a loudspeaker in the van, and then everybody just runs towards the van like lemmings. They just follow everybody else. Um, and then it ends with, and they, they go get their Pepsis, their cold Pepsis, and it ends with the words, the choice of a new generation, which is pretty funny, right? And that commercial, uh, David Foster Wallace is the first one to point this out. He said that commercial is the first time that it, it, advertising became completely ironic because mimetic desire, we could no longer advertise in the old way because it became too lame. So it, the mimetic desire had to go on the underground and you had, you had to make people think that they were on the inside of a joke. Uh, thanks, Luke. Not, not a student. Well, a student of yours, maybe, but not a, not a student. Um, you know, the canny thing, uncanny thing about mimetic desire is that it works on us even when we know it's working on us. How do we, what are some techniques you would recommend to help us want to want the right things? Uh, man, I've been trying to answer this question for the last decade, John. Uh, you and I have talked about this a lot. Um, I, I, I write weekly something called anti-memetic, so I've been thinking about this. Uh, I, I think it, you know, it starts with really um, b being aware um, that this dynamic exists and that there is an above ground and that there is an underground. You know, that's why I, I want to begin to talk about this a lot more, and you know, Dostoevsky was ahead of his time. And then once you have this awareness, uh, it requires some real intentional choices. Uh, about the things you're going to shield yourself from, maybe some of the negative uh, elements of the underground, and some of the things that you're going to expose yourself to and surround yourself by. Um, I, I mean, I, I just realized the other day that the last time that I was part of a good group of men that could get together and support each other was when I was in seminary. It was a very long time ago, right? And I'm like, it's something that I, I need in my life because I am super mimetic. And I want to I want to be really intentional about surrounding myself with the kind of men um, that can actually help me be the, the best new father that I can be. Um, so that you know, there's there's a lot to say there, but I think the awareness is step number one, and then having the humility to know that we all need help. Well, join me, please, in giving another round of applause to our speaker, Luke Burgess. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.